computer. We are recording. Okay, so uh, welcome to Wellington, New Zealand, and Noah Rochetta. You're zooming into us from Utah, Camas in Utah, where I believe it's two in the morning, that's the same morning as we are at 8 p.m. here, and you're going to be talking to us about, I hope, and whatever else, but whatever else, uh, holding views lightly and your no-nonsense journey out of the Mormon faith. That's right. So a little bit of a, what I know about you, you're the host of the podcast, Secular Buddhism, and you teach mindfulness and Buddhist philosophy online, and you've run workshops in the USA, Uganda, Germany, Spain, Mexico, and the UK. I probably left a few out there, because we've done a few more since then. Um, so you're an author, and you constantly strive to work with others to make the world a better place as you study, embody, and teach the fundamentals of Buddhist philosophy, integrating Buddhist teachings and modern science with humanism and humor. And in May 27, you graduated as lay minister Noah May Yo Rochetta at the Bright Dawn Way of Oneness Buddhist Buddhism Center in Coarse Gold, California. I hope you'll tell us something about that as well. And I'll now over to you, please. Uh, uh, okay, great. It's, the floor is yours. Hello. Thank you. I'm, I'm, first of all, I'm sorry to keep you guys waiting. Um, uh, when, when I set the alarm on this, the calendar, it does that very soft little chime to warn you that it's time to do something. And that soft little chime was not, not enough to... Uh, uh, wake me up but the uh, the phone call was loud enough and I thought uh oh <laughs> what day is it what's going on very good um, okay so you, you can hear me well from yes from there okay great uh, yeah so um, the topic that I I wanted to discuss holding views lightly um, this kind of um, became a more natural way for me as I as I went, I'm going to combine this with the uh, transition story, um, because I I went from holding views uh, very uh, death grip, <laughs> uh, the opposite of very lightly, um, and and then going through um, an experience that causes that causes you to question everything. Uh, made it very difficult to hang on to those views, and uh, as I so as I struggled with this concept, um, in a way I was forced to either hold views with the death grip or or let go of them completely. Um, and, and I did end up at first uh, trying to just let go of all views. So my transition away from what I would say is Orthodox Mormonism um, led me down a path of, of wanting, of rejecting religion entirely and wanting to not have any form of uh, connection to any kind of belief. And, um, but it was during that time as I read more about psychology, that I wanted to understand how the mind works, why, why we, uh, feel the need to believe things um, so that the, the exploration of religion led me um, down a path of studying a lot of uh, the works of um, prominent atheists and during that uh, phase when I was reading a lot of those books um, I, I encountered Sam Harris who would talk about um, mindfulness and talk about uh, some of some Eastern ways of thinking, and that led me to uh, study Buddhism. And then the more I read about Buddhism, the more it started to make sense to me that um, it was an you know one of uh, an old form of of psychology and uh, introspection. Um, and that naturally led me to uh, want to continue exploring Buddhism, but um, I wasn't interested in in and anything that felt dogmatic, anything that felt uh, ritualistic. Um, and I came across Stephen Batchelor's work and I, it really resonated with me to study Buddhism from that angle. Uh, and that's kind of um, the path that I went down ultimately that I decided I, I wanted to explore Buddhism in a, from a secular 
approach, a secular lens. Um, and during this whole transition, uh, what was happening was um, I, I was willing to have some views uh, that I could accept that if, the, if I held them lightly, then uh, it wasn't threatening anymore. Um, because I didn't have to hold it so tight that if something came and shook it, um, I either hang on to it or I let go of it. I thought, that, you know, that it really is the middle way for me now where, sure, it's just a view and it's there. And the moment something else comes along that seems better, then I may lightly let go of this one and lightly pick up that one. And, um, and not just with, um, with religious views, but what I found happening is this was happening with every other view of mine, a certain parenting style. This is how it should be. And then I'd let go and, and maybe pick up another one and say, this other view seems you know, to be more healthy or the books are talking about that you know, the latest research in psychology shows maybe I shouldn't be spanking my kids, <laughs> uh, things of that nature. Uh, and I found the same thing happening in my, with my relationship and um, the way that uh, certain dynamics of the relationship felt it has to be this way or a good relationship means this and it means that never happens. Uh, those ideas started to fall away. And again, the, the holding lightly to those views would, would allow the dynamic of the relationship to have much more flexibility. flexibility and uh, things were able to flow and, okay, well, uh, you know, maybe this doesn't have to be this way. We can slowly adjust. And I found it to be a very healthy way to allow my relationship to flourish, uh, a very healthy way to allow my um, parenting uh, skills to, to grow and flourish. And ironically, at the same time, this was happening with my worldviews. Uh, allowing those to be held lightly uh, brought me so much peace, so much internal peace. Um, so it started to happen across all of the uh, various aspects of my life that holding loosely to views, holding lightly to my views um, was a lot easier than having a death grip on my views, whether they be religious or political or uh, whatever they were. But those were two arenas that were drastic shifts for me because I had a radical shift in my worldview, uh, my ideology and religion. And uh, same with my political views. Those went through a very drastic transition. And I shifted from one spectrum over to another spectrum. Uh, and I found this happening just kind of uh, stacked over the course of a couple of years, maybe even less. Um, and suddenly I find, I found myself in this whole new world where nothing felt so rigid, everything felt pretty flexible and nothing felt so absolute anymore. There wasn't a right way or a wrong way anymore. It became, um, it became very gray. And there's, um, so while I'm going through all this, I'm starting to pay a social price. Um, the community I live in is, is very religious. And, and happens to be um, very Mormon, and my family uh, as well. And it's very scary in an Orthodox group to go unorthodox. You know, I think you're better off had you never encountered it. But if you were part of it and you leave it, and that's scary. Uh, you're kind of viewed as a as a traitor, um, as a as a form of I think you could say a poison because no one wants to be around someone who's left a certain that ideology because now you're scary it's like oh no that's that's contagious that's gonna rub off <laughs> um so i was starting to pay notice that 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 was a social uh price that that i may have to pay and that is scary um so during during this time um one of the there's a common analogy that's used uh, in, in Mormonism. It comes from the, the Book of Mormon, but there's a story in there um, of a vision. So the, the, this uh, one of the prophets is having a vision, and in his vision, he sees the tree of life, 
And at the end, the, the tree of life has a, a rod that leads to it. And in his dream, his family members are hanging on to the rod. And, and, and two of them, his, two of his sons aren't holding the rod. They let go. And because they let go of the path that leads to the, the tree, they wander and they get lost. And when they're lost, they go to this big building. And that's where everyone in that building is pointing back at the people at the rod and they're like saying, you, shame, uh, you are, uh, essentially you are idiots for following this path. And uh, the conclusion, the moral of the story as he tells it is, uh, if you hang, if you, if you hold to that rod tightly, then you'll walk through the mists, you walk on the cliffs, you'll make it through whatever the terrain life is giving you and you make it to the end, to the tree of life, where, you know, a heaven, so to speak. But the, the insinuation of that story is don't you dare hold lightly to that rod. Because if you do, you run the risk of, of getting lost, leaving the path, and, and heaven forbid, worse of all, you go to the building where you point back at everyone and make fun of them for hanging on to the rod. And that has enabled culturally... Um, for Mormons to be able to accuse anyone who leaves as you're one of those who let go of the rod. And there you are in the building pointing at us saying, we're silly for hanging on to this. It, it becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy because anyone who's ever let go, you're immediately treated as, well, now I don't need to listen to you. Whatever you're going to say against my beliefs or my religion, yeah, of course you will. You're that person in the building. That's what you do. You, you make fun of us. And I knew this. I knew this early on that I would be viewed as one of those rebels. So I was having this conversation with one of my local leaders where he was, he brought this up and he said, we're, we're very worried about you because it seems you've let go of the path. And I said, well, before we get into this discussion, I want you to know that uh, it, as, as I've been studying Buddhism, I see this in a different light now. I said, because in this story, there's a river that divides the two. If you let go of the path, you, there's a river, and then everyone crosses that path and gets to that building. And so that's, that's an important part of the story is the distinction, the border between uh, good land and bad land, right? There's, there's this river. So as we're having this conversation, I told them, I said, on land, you stand in a place of certainty, where you guys are, are certain that you're on the right path and it's the only path. And then when someone leaves that path, you're, they're also certain. Uh, they're standing on the other shore, pointing back, right? Making fun of you guys. But there's also a place of certainty. They're certain that you shouldn't be hanging on to that rod. I said, I find myself on an inner tube floating down the river in the middle of the two. <laughs> I said, you don't have to worry. I'm not pointing back at you guys saying how silly for holding on to the rod. Uh, and I'm also not hanging on to the rod saying, oh, woe unto you, those who have let go of this rod. I said, I, that's how I view this now is I'm just kind of here floating. And I said, and, and to make the uh, analogy uh, a little hit home a little more, in my case, my, my wife is still uh, an orthodox believer of the religion. So not only have I let go of the rod and I'm wandering in the river, I'm holding hands with someone who's hanging on to the rod. <laughs> and I said, so you don't need to worry about me. Uh, I'm, I'm holding her hand, so uh, I'm not going to go too far. So that was the discussion I had with him. And, and it, you know, I don't think it had ever been interpreted that way. And it kind of appeased him a bit to think, well, at least he's not in that building on the other side of the shore pointing back at us. But you know that uh, exploring that analogy and, and explaining that I'm on the inner tube in the river stuck with me. And I thought, in what other aspects of life does that make sense for me to, to realize uh, holding lightly to me means you can walk on that path and you can hold that rod, but it's not a death grip. And you can let go of it and you can cross and you maybe go explore the building. Hey, what are you guys doing in here? What are you pointing at? <laughs> um, but not pointing back, that's also holding, uh, that's not holding lightly, right? That's again, holding 
uh, the death grip on my view is right and look how silly you are for your views over there on that side of the shore. And it was, it was fun to be able to extract, if anything, that analogy and use it as a way of saying, I never want to hold tightly to one side or the other. I never want to feel that uh, sense of trapped again, where this is what I'm hanging on to and I better never let go. Um, but at the same time, I have no interest to be on the other shore in the building pointing back saying, you know, now I'm certain again, but this time I'm certain that it's, that's false and this is true. And now I'm in the building, you know, I feel very comfortable navigating the, the middle way in my inner tube, floating down the river, wherever that's going to take me, because that'll always be the divider between the two lands. Uh, and that seems like a safe territory for me, at least right now. Um, so that's, that's how I started to view this concept of, of holding lightly to things. And I've encountered in the years since I've gone down this path and I started a podcast and um, what I find, the audience that tends to reach out to me most are people who have become disaffected from religion and they're trying to navigate that journey from uh, any kind of orthodox belief to any to, to an unorthodox approach. And I found that this is happening with every major religion, including Buddhism. Um, the, the transition from a, a fixed view that is a, a certain view to a more open, I don't know approach, the agnostic approach, I could say. And that for a lot of people, that's, that's a difficult transition, especially in um, ideologies that are they're very fundamental in their view. For example, Mormonism, where um, there's only one right way. And of course, they happen to have the right way. And everyone else's view may be good. They'll, they'll, they'll tell you this. It, it, it's, it could be good, but it's not complete. It's not true. Um, and that's a difficult transition because when that happens, when you go through that, uh, like it did for me, um, your whole foundation just collapses. You had so much certainty. I knew who I was and where I came from and why I'm here and what will happen when I die. I knew it all. Didn't mean I, it all made sense because it didn't, but at least I knew. Uh, and that was a very difficult thing to let go of, that certainty, the, uh, you know, the, the explanation of what, what happens when you die and why, why are we here, all of that. How did, there was an answer to it all. And then I found myself in this new place where I didn't have any answers to anything. I'm just here. And I remember a, a Facebook meme that was floating around that I found that uh, really hit home while I was going through this that said, um, it had like a, a sketch of, of, of planet Earth. And it said, just remember at the end of the day, we're monkeys clinging to a rock, flying through space, trying to figure out what it's all about or something like that. And, and I remember that felt so comforting to think that is that's true that's all i know i'm <laughs> i'm an evolved monkey clinging to a rock flying through space and i don't know i don't know what's going on <laughs> and that's been my my comfort uh is holding loosely to things and and holding loosely to um everything right even even with um all the technology that comes out i hold loosely to it because you know, if I held on tightly to my CDs, what happens when MP3s take over CDs, right? <laughs> um, and whatever we've got now, whatever's coming next, I, I feel holding lightly is, is such a safe strategy because it doesn't mean, to me, it doesn't mean, okay, then I'm not going to embrace anything. To me, it means I will embrace whatever makes sense to embrace and I will let go of it the moment it makes sense to let go of it. I think technology is the perfect example there, right? It's not like, oh, well, I'm not going to get into MP3s because it'll be replaced one day. It's like, no, I'll just go with, go with the flow. I'll use MP3s now, and when it's the next thing, it's the next thing. And I look at my giant DVD collection over there knowing one day that'll be like my cassette collection that's in the, that I eventually finally threw away. <laughs> um, so that's how I view uh this concept of holding uh, holding loosely or lightly to ideas 
And this has interfaced pretty well with my understanding of, of non-attachment. I encounter uh, quite often here as I talk about uh, non-attachment to someone coming from a very fundamentalist background that uh, non-attachment is equated to detachment. And, I, and I'm often reminded of this analogy again of, you know, the, the shore. On one side of the shore, you've got this rod and its attachment. And on the other side of the shore, where you also have certainty, that's detachment. And again, this is the middle way. This is uh, non-attachment is, is holding loosely. You can, you can be holding on to something. You can be attached to a view, but it doesn't have to be a death grip. Because the moment life changes and it makes sense to change your view, you change with it. And uh, I use this analogy often about how life is like a game of Tetris. And, and I think this goes really well with the idea of, of holding loosely uh, because whatever, if you, are you familiar with, with Tetris? Did you guys all play that? So, you know, when at any given moment, the configuration of the game, that's what you've got, right? And holding loosely doesn't mean fine, I'm giving up the game, put the game down. It says, no, you can play the game, but just know the shapes, new shape shows up, you got a whole new thing that you're working with. And in the moment you place that and it's locked in, uh, there's a new shape and now you're working with it again. And to me, that's what holding lightly or holding loosely to views, that's what that means to me. It means I'm gonna work with what I've got right now and un with the understanding that it's all changing all the time. And the moment life throws a new piece, a new shape at me, doesn't matter if I like it or not, if I wanted it or not, um, it's, it's what showed up. This is now what I'm working with and, and here we go. And there is a little bit of control, right? You can move it left and right, you can rotate it, try to make it fit the best way possible, but then, uh, then you're moving on to the next piece. And uh, that has really worked for me to think of life in that context. That life is like the game of Tetris, holding lightly to my views is like accepting that my views are gonna change. Uh, I, in my own life, I can look back and say with confidence that uh, 10 years ago, that me would never ever in a million years expect that this me to be who I am today, a non-believer, would never have happened. I had so much certainty in my views and in my beliefs. And I didn't wanna make the mistake of reaching the point where to have that certainty again in my life, even if it was the counter, right? Now I'm so certain I'll never believe that again. I don't know, who knows what's gonna happen in 10 years. I certainly didn't see myself here <laughs> 10 years ago. Um, and, and I try to do that with every aspect of my life, whether it be the big ideological religious views, but also the smaller views, like I mentioned before, parenting tactics, uh, relationship dynamics, um, uh, certainly the technology at work, right? I'm, I'm, in the, I'm, I'm in that space where everything I learned in college for multimedia is obsolete. 90% uh, 90, 90 of it is obsolete because it's been replaced with new technologies, new software, uh, new styles of programming. I, I, I did programming in college. So you can imagine how much that has evolved. Um, so I, I haven't abandoned what I learned, but I, I've held lightly uh, the teachings that I was given in college and they've adapted and they've morphed. And that's why I'm still um, relevant in that space. I, I can still do computer programming today because had I held tightly to those views and nope, that's the only way to do it, life would have evolved around me and I'd be obsolete today. I would not be uh, doing much with programming because I didn't go with the flow and, and adapt. Um, so now I look at that experience and I think, man, I don't ever wanna do that again. I don't ever wanna fix on one thing and say, it's done. You know, here's the Tetris game. I've got all the shapes where I want, I'm done. I'm not touching anything, I'm not moving anything because we know what would happen, right? The shapes would keep showing up and the game gets all messed up again because you weren't, you weren't adjusting it and going with it. Um, so that to me is the concept of holding lightly to views. Um, 
uh, again, the analogy with, with that rod, I'm not, I don't feel like the answer is everybody let go of that rod right now. <laughs> uh, it's more of if that works for you right now, hold on to it. If it doesn't work for you, don't go down that path, try some other path. And suddenly there's much more freedom with the view because there's not, uh, there's not one path that is the right path. And I've been finding this even in the Buddhist approach as I, as I uh, embrace this concept of a, a secular form of, of Buddhism, I encounter on both sides, uh, people who will say, um, no, you need to embrace more of the uh, orthodox way to practice. And people on the other camp say, no, you, you need to fully uh, unattach from anything religious and, and go even more secular. And I find myself once again in that same situation where it's like, hey, if that works for you, you go that way. If that works for you, you go that way. Um, you have hiking boots on. That trail is going to work for you. If this person doesn't have hiking boots on, you better go that way. Take this other <laughs> approach in life. Uh, and I found that in, in, in my own inner circles, that's what works with, you know, I, I feel no pressure to convince my wife, for example, that, hey, you should adopt a, a more middle way. It's like, no, she hasn't gone through what I've gone through. You know, life put me on this path where suddenly I found I didn't have my, uh, uh, I didn't have the right shoes for that path I was on and it was hurting my feet. So I had to go a different way. And guess what? Now my feet don't hurt because I'm on a path that works for the, the current configuration of whatever I'm wearing. Um, so that's, yeah, in a nutshell, that's, that's where I am now. I find myself uh, very content with how, how I'm interfacing with the shapes that show up in my life in every aspect, whether they be the dynamics of how I deal with the the, the community that I live in that's highly religious and orthodox, the uh, relationship dynamics of, a, of an orthodox believer and a non-believer, raising kids in that environment and dynamic, um, to the interactions at work with coworkers. Um, but I find myself very comfortable navigating these waters because I don't feel that need to find the certainty anymore. Where my quest for so long was... Um, to find the truth out there. And I was determined when I, when I first left Mormonism, it's like, okay, well, that one wasn't right. I'm going to find the right one. And I just dove into the books and I was determined to go find the, you know, the, the other right rod to hang on to that will lead me to where I need to go. And in the end of all of it, I, now I have no interest in any rods. Uh, I'd have no interest in any trees. I don't want to end up at the, the tree of this or the tree of that. I just want to go explore. I want to see what's over that next hill. I want to come back and I want to say, hey, I didn't like that. I'm back. Uh, I'm going to go check out that other hill now. <laughs> um, and, and that's where I find myself in my personal life. Very comfortable with that. Um, so that, that's my understanding of, 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 the, of views. And I, I wanted to open this up a little to the discussions or, or question and answers around any of these ideas so thank you guys for for listening uh and hopefully the audio is okay all right thank thank you noah i'm gonna walk the computer over to anybody who wants to answer a question any who's the first question ah hey noah. Hey, noah. Um, my name's alex um i i guess um hearing this the talk about the idea of having a certainty um, and sort of floating in between the idea of um, being sure that you're not and sure that you are and, and being comfortable in that space in between. One thing which I'm thinking about is um, to some extent right now, you've kind of still in some way sort of achieved a, a type of certainty, which is a certainty that you're certain you don't want to be holding onto the rod or in the, um, in the room or on the other side. Um, so you've kind of achieved a kind of certainty in between. I guess what I'm wondering is, um, you're finding that comfortable at the moment. What is it that's stopping you? Or what is it that's kind of, what do you have as almost a reinforcement that you're right? Because um, I suppose for, for lots of secular Buddhists, you might be, say, in a sangha or something like that. You might be in a group or a community. Do you have like a community that you rely on or, or, or can, can, can touch on? 
Um, so I do have um, like an online community that I've uh, built up with a, um, my, my Facebook page, Secular Buddhism, it has grown. And out of that page of 90,000 or so members, I do have like an online um, community. That's a, it's a Facebook group with about 3,000 members. And that's, uh, I guess, the closest thing to being like a sangha that I can go to, people that I can talk to, bounce ideas back up back and forth with and that's been a, a very helpful community to be connected with um, in my particular case um, I haven't uh, so I, I thought about this as a mental exploration early on um, what I found is in this transition out of religion what I find is people are really struggling with it when they're still in and trying to decide, should I be in or should I be out? If, if they decide they should stay in, things are good. If they decide they should leave, then things are good again. It's that transition where there's no certainty that's really painful because they don't, you don't know. And I found myself going through that same thing, right? It's uh, the moment I decided and I felt secure that this, it was okay to not be in, but it was also okay to not be out. Um, I found comfort again. And I thought about that because I thought, well, that's interesting. Just like what you pointed out, isn't that certainty again? Isn't that the certainty of not needing certainty feels like certainty. And I think in some ways, yeah, that, that is what it is. Uh, as long as you're not torn between should I be there or should I be there, then you're perfectly content where you are. The difference, I think, is to be standing somewhere and say, I could be there, but I'm not, I'm here. Versus standing somewhere saying, I could not be there. I would never stand there again. Um, I feel like I've adopted the more, uh, more flexible approach where it's, I'm just here right now. I don't know where I'll be later. Um, so yeah, I guess you could say in some ways there is that sense of certainty, but it's a much more flexible certainty. It's, it's more of the, I'm just here right now because this is what makes sense in life right now, but I have no clue where I'll be later. And uh, you know, it's very rare for someone who's left a religion to say, I guess, I don't know, in 10 years, if this or that happened, yeah, I could be back. Uh, most people will tell you, no, I will never go back to that way of thinking including myself. I mean, I want to think that, but the truth is, I don't know. Like I said before, I have no, I, I had no idea I would ever be capable of not believing what I believe. Um, I think it's highly unlikely, but sure, I guess if something happened <laughs> that uh, led me down that path, I could go back to being believing. I just can't imagine what it would be that would allow that to happen. I have no clue what it would take because it seems impossible, um, but I, I wouldn't say that it's impossible. I don't know if that kind of answers your question. Yeah, no, it does. Yeah. Thank you. Next question. Yeah. Hi, Noah. Um, I'm ironically Noah. Hi. So. Oh, cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, my question is, taken maybe maybe taken to an extreme how do you how do you, how do you fit holding views lightly into kind of the eternal human search for meaning for what do i do with my life what should i be doing with my life what am i going to value like if everything is held lightly how what what's your criteria for well i'm going to hold this right now at the very least how do you how do you how do you establish at least enough certainty to move forward to something and, instead of just well I, I'll believe this right now but oh what about that shiny thing over there and what about that and you're not holding on to any of it and 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 how do you just keep from flitting around um, and kind of being aimless? Yeah, that's that's a really good question um, because I think. I mean, I've encountered this myself where it's like, uh, then what's the point of having a goal or uh, what kind of aspirations do I want? 
And I've had to sit with that and think, okay, well, if the, if, if the slate is clean, what do I want to put on that slate? What do I want to, where do I want to go with all of this? And I, you know, I had to explore this with like in my uh, relationships, for example, uh, why, what's the point? Do I, would I really want to stay in this relationship and make it work? Um, so starting with, with some of those bigger things like relationships, um, I did explore and realize, okay, this is what I want. This is where I want to be. This is what I want to be doing. Uh, I don't exactly know why, you know, someone would say, well, give me a good reason why. I don't know because it, it but I, I like the way things are. And I, so I obviously have goals to strengthen that and work on that in that sense of, oh, look, something shiny that hasn't come up with in my relationship, that hasn't come up with my career. I haven't really, you know, thrown it all away and just go start something new. Like, you know, the typical midlife crisis scenario hasn't, I didn't have an existential crisis and change of everything. I didn't go through that. And I oddly find myself still um, very content with specific things that I like. For example, hobbies. Uh, I, I'm a paraglider pilot and a paramotor pilot. And it's something that I, I really enjoy doing. And I have, I've set several new goals uh, in the next 12 months. I want to uh, take it to a new level and become uh, an instructor and teach people to fly. And I've thought about uh you know well what happens if somewhere in that along that way i were to be injured and now i can't walk or now i can't fly um and i thought well that to me that again that it goes into i'm playing tetris um and the shapes the way that they show up and what i've got right now i can play this game I'll play it all day long and i i enjoy playing it the way that it is if a shape shows up that is so drastic it requires me to change trajectory then i will um and the difference for me I, at least i feel in theory is that as as heartbroken as i would be if suddenly i couldn't fly i think i would accept it pretty quickly and say okay i you know i broke my back i'm in a wheelchair i guess that's the end of that path i won't be an instructor uh but i'll I'll see if there's any other way to still enjoy that sport from a wheelchair. I don't know. Um, again, it's, it's the, the flexibility that's there for me. It hasn't been an issue of you drop everything and now you don't, you don't care about things. Um, for me, it's been very much, a, I still care and I'm still going to do what I, what I've been doing, but knowing that if and when I need to change that, I'll, I'll change that. Thank you. Now let's let's ask for another question. Ah, yeah. No, hi. Thank you. That's really hi. good. Interesting talk. I appreciate it. And I'm Derek. Thank you. Um, forgot nice that. To meet you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I'm pursuing a theme that uh, Alex and Noah have been asking about too. I'm going to cast it a little bit as a metaphor. We live in Wellington which is a harbour city, you know, on the ocean. And it's a very windy city as well. So a lot of yacht, and yachts will sail out in the harbour, and there's all the winds. The thing that prevents the yacht just getting tipped over by the next wind is it's got a deep keel, and it's got a rudder. And the sense they get in some of what you've talked about is that uh, holding lightly is, is a, a rudder or a keel, you know, in all the changing circumstances of life. Because to pursue the metaphor a little bit more, if you tried to hold one rod, always the one course with a yacht, the wind changes again and you get tipped over, the yacht capsizes. I, what I'm circling around with these metaphors to try and ask is what other things, if any, kind of uh, help hold you stable? What I'm hearing you describe as holding views lightly is something that helps hold you stable. And there are other things. And I'm, and I'm wondering, you know, for me, the path of um, uh, 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 the Buddha's spiritual path, if I can put it that way, is both meditation and study, as with you, and also um, 
uh, uh, ethical or moral behavior. So I don't know if that's a well enough question to respond to, but I hope you can have a go. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I like that analogy because um, to me, the, the, this concept of holding views lightly, like you said, it's the recognition that winds change and when winds change, you adjust the sails, you may need to steer in a new direction, um, you may need to do these things, but at the end of the day, it's still a boat. A boat does what a boat does, it floats, hopefully, right? That's what, that's what you want it to keep doing. Um, and with us, it's the same, like we have changes, ideological changes, political changes, whatever, whatever however our views are changing, we're still, we continue to be the nature of what we are. We're humans. We, we have, uh, we still have desires. We have um, everything that it entails to be human, right? Thoughts and emotions and uh, uh, feelings that we're trying to deal with. So to me, this idea of holding lightly to, to views implies uh, the obvious, which is, um, we're still going to encounter our thoughts and emotions and feelings, and we're going to continue being human. And in that sense, there, there's some stability there because, you know, I'm, I'm still subject to what it is to be human. But the flexibility that I see is with using your analogy with the boat is the boat can change directions. The boat can adjust its sails. The boat can move the rudder from one direction to another one. It may need some, you know, more weight on, on the left now versus the right, all kinds of adjustments, but the boat's still a boat and all the other things are still what they are. The water is water and the wind is wind. Um, so tying that with the, the two previous questions, um, I think for us, it's the same. A lot changes, but a lot doesn't change at the same time. We're still dealing with the nature of being being a human that encounters uh, emotions that arise when you're stuck at the red light in traffic, right? <laughs> um, so the, the idea of holding lightly to the views is recognizing some of this stuff that can be very flexible where I didn't think it was flexible. And other aspects of it are just part of the nature of, of, of what we are right now as human beings. And I try to do the best that I can with what is flexible, recognizing I'm going to turn this sail here and I'm going to turn this rudder there and I'm going to, and wow, that all worked. But then I'm still going to run up with, man, I wish I, I was a submarine, but I'm not a submarine. I'm still a boat. <laughs> you know, I don't know if that kind of uh, adds to the, the wonderful analogy you use, but to me, that's helpful to, to remember. I'm still a boat and wind is still wind and, and some of these things are what they are. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. We're reminded just about every day that wind is still wind. Windy well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> excuse me, I like to say one is like Chicago because it's windy, but the other is like Chicago. It's our capital city, so it's full of politicians. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Oh, hey, um, I think this is, hi, I'm Jan. Hi, I've Jan. I've been coming along to this group for three or four years, and, oh, more, really? than, that, more yeah. than that, okay, mm -hmm. long time. Anyway, um, we're just, I, there's a lovely quote from some English guys in the 20s and 30s, and one of them says, you have some extreme views, and the other one says, yes, but I hold them very lightly. And I just thought that it's like, <laughs> you can speak lightly as well, you know, and you can also move from them. Oh, but the, the thing, I love that. Yeah, the, and the thing which I wanted to um, kind of ask is um, within Mormonism, I saw a wonderful documentary uh, a couple of months ago, and it was about gay people in Utah. Hold on, I, I can't quite hear you. Okay, say that again. Oh, film, film was a recent film festival, and there were some gay people in Utah who were wanting to stay within the Mormon church. And so, in a sense, mm -hmm. they, were, 
they were kind of demanding that the Mormon church expand to contain them. You know, they said, this is my culture, my life, my context, my, um, you know, this is where I belong in terms of, you know, being, and, um, and I thought that's kind of, to me, there's, there's another opportunity there, which is almost to say, I, I deserve to belong in the community that has held and nurtured me and it's like, uh, and almost to sort of be very gently tugging on the outside to say I, I belong with you I still I shouldn't have to give you up and the way that you found is is a sort of profound form of wisdom and free thinking and I think that's that's such a sort of uh, it's such a precious piece of human development to have taken on you know you've had an epiphany you've changed your world view and I just wondered um yeah I just if you had any comments about that really. <laughs> yeah thank you um yeah so what you bring up um I encountered in in, in my own way there was kind of this a movement within Mormonism to try to open up a space for uh, unorthodox Mormons to be a part of the greater community. Um, and I find, found myself for a while in that boat. I still uh, back and forth kind of go with that idea of, is there really space for people like me there? Um, and I've struggled with it because a part of me recognizes that the way that this culture is set up, there, is, there isn't room for someone like me. Um, and so I, I still go with, with my family from time to time, but I, I, I go as a silent visitor that's just there sitting. If I were to express my views or, or anything, I think I would be met with, um, I'm not sure where I would be met with, but I think it would be like, don't, don't share that here. This isn't the place for that. <laughs> um, and I struggled with that because I thought, why can't there be room there for an unorthodox uh, view to be held in the realm of an orthodox view. And, and I think what I've run into is because it's an orthodox place. In an orthodox place, there is no room for an unorthodox uh, view. Um, so I struggled with that because there are a lot of Mormons who are starting to break out of the, the, the strict orthodox approach. And they'll bend a little bit on this view or on that view or on this practice or that practice. Um, but it's a painful process. I think I, I view it like this. It's this bubble or a balloon that's slowly stretching. But it can be painful when you're pushing on it. Because you push on it and it pushes back. And then you push on it a little bit more. And maybe after a while, yeah, that part of the, uh, of the shape has stretched a little. Um, and that's what it takes for there to be change. It takes people willing inside to keep pushing. Um, and at times I think, I don't want that to be me. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll just let others do that. Uh, and then sometimes I think, but if it's not people like me, who would ever do it? How would it ever change? Uh, and I see that happening like with the, um, with the gay community that you, you mentioned with uh, that is a, a, a pretty large community here in Utah that is on, trying to stay on the inside, trying to push to expand the views a little bit, meeting a lot of resistance and pushback. But all in all, if you were to compare it now to say five years ago, there has been uh, subtle changes that are taking place and it's very promising. Um, so from one perspective, it's, it's frustrating because it's like, well, but it's not changing fast enough. Um, and from another perspective, it's, it, it's encouraging because you realize, but there is some change. And if we, can keep to, if we can keep at it and keep pushing from the inside, eventually you'll see um, bigger change. But yeah, that, that's certainly an aspect of it that I struggle with almost every day, almost, well, for sure weekly. Every time I'm there where I think, why do I keep coming? I don't like how I feel at the end of the day. I don't like how I feel at the end of a certain talk. Uh, where, where, you know, I just heard something that rubs against the, the wrong direction for me. And I, and I, and I feel like, why do I, why do I subject myself to this? Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of struggle there. It's like tug of war kind of goes one way and then kind of goes another way. And you're just hoping that little by little, it's slowly moving. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. Fascinating. Yeah, thank you. Well, now we're at three o'clock in the morning. Now, so you've been with us for an hour. Is it? Yes. Yeah. Your time is three in the morning. Oh, yeah. Here it's That's three. Right. Here it's nine o'clock. Thank you. I wonder if I can ha exit full screen. Here it's nine o'clock, so thank you very much. And uh, for us, it's good night. And thank has you. anybody any, go any final comments or Thanks, final I'll points? I'd just like to say, though, no, you're, you're, I'm Jim, your anchor's your family. So the keel is your family. Yeah, I love that. You, you, your boat might be going to other place, but you do have an anchor. You do have yeah. a keel. Yeah. For sure. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, guys. you Noah, And um, I hope you have a good night's sleep now. Thank you. You okay. too. Cheerio. Bye-bye. Bye. Take care.